who are Gen Z? Tell me about them. Okay, so Gen Z, in a South African context, we can also refer to them as the born free generation. This is the generational cohort that was born in the mid-1990s, so conveniently at the sort of end of apartheid and going into the new South Africa. And they are just coming of age right now. So this is the sort of class of 2020 that is graduating into the year of Corona. Yeah, okay, cool. And what is important to them? What are their values? What are they interested in? This generation is highly aware of what's going on in the world. And we have to understand that this is the first generation of, as we call them, digital natives. They were born up into a world that already was using technology and the internet and social media. They haven't grown up alongside it like the millennials did. Rather, they were born into a world where they've never not been connected. And because of this, they obviously know a lot more about what's going on in the world from a global and from a local context that previous generations would have done. Previously, even when I was growing up, I'm a millennial, in the 80s, the only news that you got from the outside world was perhaps at the sort of 7 or 8 o'clock news that your parents watched. Whereas this generation has been able to find out that news for themselves and not just hear the news, they've also contributed to the news because that's what social media allows us to do. And when it comes to their relationship with social media, I mean, what are they wanting? What are they looking for? What doesn't work for them, um, you know, in terms of the content they want to consume and the content that they want to upload? Yeah, so that's a very interesting point. So once again, we can contrast them quite nicely with the millennial generation. So the millennial generation was the generation that adopted and propagated the success of the first wave of social media platforms, as we would call them. So you've got Twitter, you've got Facebook, and you've got Instagram. And what, we ha what all those platforms really have in common is a lot of curation. You are placing your best self forward. You know, we talk about like the envy generation and how we all believe everyone else's life is so much more fantastic than our own is because we're putting this perfect facade onto our social media right. platforms and of course Instagram is perhaps the best example of what a social media platform was for a millennial. You put the beautiful filtered selfies, they're always perfect looking, you have this curated life on your feed. Now what's different with Generation Z is they're engaging with social media in a much more real way. So they're not using so many filters. They're wanting to connect with real people. They're not as impressed by celebrity or shiny facades as, say, the millennial generation was. And this is perhaps simply because they've grown up being overexposed to perfection. And perfection is not actually very interesting. And we know the jokes. If you scroll through Instagram, everything kind of looks the same. The millennial aesthetic yeah. is quite pervasive. And it's not real and raw. And we've also got to remember that this generation has grown up with constant global turmoil. They've grown up with the spectre of climate change hanging over them. And not just something that was spoken about at UN conferences, this is something that is spoken about in their schools and in their homes every day. So they've grown up with just the desire to address bigger issues. Mm -hmm. From a political perspective, same thing. They've grown up, first of all, in South Africa, they've grown up understanding the difference between the old and the new South Africans and what that means for their place in that world. They are highly aware of the challenges going on in the world. They've also grown up with the threat of terrorism. This is the generation that has been exposed to those horrific school shootings in America. And this is the generation that is forming activism against those sorts of things. This is also the generation that is changing the zeitgeist with regards to race relations. If we look at the, what's going on in the world right now, it's this generational cohort that is very engaged with all of these big grand challenges facing society. And perhaps for that reason, their relationship with social media is a lot more of an activist role and a lot less of a broadcasting of social perfection kind of role. Okay. And of course, we also have to understand that every generation likes to rebel against previous generations. And of course, you don't want to be hanging out in the same social media platforms as your parents were. So all these things have a life cycle. And quite frankly, when your boomer grandparents are posting on Facebook, it's the <laughs> last place you really want to be going to connect with your friends. So they're carving out a new space for themselves on new social media platforms platforms that speak to them and their place in the world. And snack media is hugely valuable to this generation, also highly visual and more video content and less sort of still curated, perfectly framed pictures like we what saw previously. What do you mean previously. by snack media? So snack media is very short bites 
of content. So if you look at TikTok, they only allow you to post 60 seconds of a, worth of a video. So that's a very short amount of time to get your story and get your point across. Right, okay, cool. Yeah. So is that why they love TikTok so much? What is it about TikTok that makes them um, get so addicted to the platform? Well, once again, there it's not that different to the other social networks. These social networks are designed to addict us to them. They're designed to give us more of what we want. They're designed to have algorithms that feed us. If we like something, they check how long you've spent watching one of those videos. They'll feed you more and more of the same. So they almost create your own personal wormhole or little echo chamber that you can go down. So everyone's experience with those apps are very, very different. But they also catching on with these younger generations because they are real and a lot more raw. So if you look at the visual aesthetic of TikTok, it's a lot less curated than some of the other platforms. People aren't necessarily wearing as much makeup. You'll see people wearing no makeup, even young girls, you know, which is very unusual compared to those of us who have grown up in the very curated, very perfectionist sort of right. world of social media as we've known it today. And they're carving out their own space there. They're not just using it as a social network though, they're also using it quite a lot as an activist platform. And I think that's one of the trends that has most interested us and yeah. the work we do at Flux Trends in that how engaged in activism young people are on these platforms. Is this generation the woke generation? I just don't know if they'd, if they'd explain themselves in that way, but they definitely are aware of what's going on in the world and they're not prepared just to complain about it. They want to go out and change it. And we've just done some research on focus groups with Gen Zs in South Africa and what is hugely different to the focus groups we've done with slightly older people or different cohorts is how they say we're aware of the problems in the world, but we're not going to expect older people to fix them for us. We know that we have to fix them ourselves and that is a huge flip around mm. from conversations we've had with 18, 19, 20 year olds in the past. Now, TikTok hasn't been around for that long, but it's grown so quickly. What would you attribute that to? I mean, the affinity has been phenomenal just to when you look at the numbers, it's just exponential growth um, in terms of people getting on the platform and then people getting as many followers as they're getting. So what would you attribute that to? One of the reasons that it has grown so fast is, as I said, the algorithms are particularly good at getting people sucked in and engaging with that platform. And people often talk about TikTok addiction, like you can't put it down once you've started. The music's very catchy, the songs are very relatable, there's lots, and there's so many people on the platform, there's quite easy to find someone that you connect with, that sort of sucks you down into that rabbit hole. Another reason it's more popular than some of the other social media platforms is how quickly you are able to accrue followers yeah. and get that engagement. And that's what we're really seeking when we go onto social media. We are headed for that endorphin rush that we get when someone likes our post, when someone clicks on our content, when someone gives us validation. And TikTok's been very, very good at that. I mean, you can post 100 pictures on Instagram and get maybe two likes, unless you happen to be particularly pretty or particularly popular. But on TikTok, ordinary people can go on there and amass millions of followers within a very short amount of time. And that validation is highly addictive. And how important are or influential are those huge TikTokers? I mean, we're speaking to some of the greatest influencers, the ones that have got millions and millions of followers. How influential are they to their peer group? Hugely, they are hugely influential to each other. I mean, we're starting to see these sort of like TikTok cults, as people call them, where people will sort of rally around a particularly popular TikTok curator or creator and actually form like a fan club that will do whatever that TikTok cult leader, as the term is, demands. So they could do things like popularize a particular meme. So that person will say, okay, we're all gonna share this meme, we're all gonna dance to this particular swatch of music, and off they go and do it. And it's been quite almost frightening for us as sort of social trend commentators to see how people are prepared to fall into line from a sort of a, an online group. So this sort of group mentality, which can obviously be used for good or for not so good reasons. One of the more quirky recent examples here would be how TikTok groups got together with the, with the goal of trolling Donald Trump by, by going online and booking seats that they had no intention of 
filling at his political rallies. And they've done similar things with merchandise stores, with political characters that they don't like. So they'd go and load their carts full of merchandise so it looks like it's sold out and then they never complete the purchase. So, you know, like they're doing these sort of like group projects online, which is interesting, but it's also a little bit frightening because we could see how people that might have malevolent agendas behind them could buy into that sort of group mindset and get people to do less constructive things with That's that power. It's so interesting that they, they can mobilize and be so powerful. Um, so if my child wants to get onto TikTok, TikTok, are there dangers that they should be aware of? Is there, are there any threats that I should be aware of? Because I mean, as a parent, I just see kids dancing to dance challenges and they are uploading certain pictures and doing funny jokes. But are there any threats I should be conscious of or cognizant of? Absolutely. So firstly, you need to be 13 to be on TikTok. So it's not a very high age limit like some of the other social platforms, but there is that age limit. So you probably shouldn't be letting your very small children create their own profiles out there. Now, at the same time, TikTok's got all the same dangers that all the other social media platforms have. There are definitely predators out there. We know that not all people are bad people, but there are bad people out there mm -hmm. and they're not you know, immune from merging on any one of these platforms that we engage with. So all the same risks are in play, risks of grooming, risks of getting sucked up by radical groups, because of course everyone's TikTok journey goes down its own unique rabbit hole and it can take you to some quite dark places. So there's adult content out there, you do need to be aware of that, you need to make sure the sort of people that your children are engaging with are people that you would approve. And that's such a challenge for parents because you don't want to obviously pry into your children's privacy too much, but you have to protect them from what is out there. And there's pretty much no topic and no content that is off limits online right now. So it's all the good and the bad that comes with complete connection. Of course, you get to learn more things and get a better context of the world in general, but you're also exposed to a lot more dangers. There's also the dangers of bullying and peer pressure. So we're getting to the point where, you know, younger children, just going back to that mom mentality, might gang up onto a particular child, just like they would do in the real world. Bullying has always been a problem at school, but online it becomes that much more demoralizing for that child's mindset because they're unable to escape from it. Right. If you were bullied at school, you could still go home and feel safe. Mm -hmm. Now your bullies follow you online. You know, they, you can't switch off from that. So that's another thing to be aware of. And then of course, all the issues of digital future privacy and all the ways that whatever you put out there is online is there for the rest of your life. Mm. And if it's something that could come back to haunt you in the future, it could have hugely detrimental effects on your future career, on your future family, on your future relationships. Cancel culture is not something to mess around with lightly, saying the wrong thing online. One careless tweet, one careless TikTok post can ruin your life. Mm. And it might be a reckoning that only comes five, ten years down the line. Mm. So we have to be aware of that. So we've been speaking to some TikTokers that have got huge followings. What makes somebody um, so popular? What is it about an individual or the content they upload that makes them so popular? Um, is it an X factor? Is it unique? Is it different for everyone? Or are there certain similarities or characteristics that, uh, you know, that they might have in common? Well, firstly, with most of these social media platforms, luck does play a role, as does being an early mover on those platforms, right. because with algorithms, it's very much a vicious and virtuous circle system where the winners tend to take all. If you're popular, you become more popular. The more people right. like your stuff, the more it's served to the more people, which is why you get people with very huge follow accounts and other people that have very, very small ones. And you don't have sort of so much of a, of a lovely, smooth bell curve right. of, <laughs> of success on these platforms. But that's said, looking at the sort of people who are popular on TikTok, they're quite different to the sort of people that are popular on an Instagram or on a Twitter, for example. Okay. So on Instagram, you need to be, you know, let's, there's not a very nice way to say it, but you need to be sort of pretty and perfect to sort yeah. of get a lot of followers there. You know, you have to be good looking and your home needs to be good looking and all your pictures need to be pretty. Whereas on TikTok, you need to be real, you need to be engaging, and you need to have a little bit of a sense of humor. People are going there to be entertained. So you'll see the sort of characters that are popular on TikTok are very personable, mm. very relatable, and they don't come across with the sort of influencer arrogance. They don't come across as celebrities, they come across as successful, normal people, which is a big shift with this generation. They are not impressed with celebrity culture 
at all. I mean, we've done surveys and we've seen that the heroes of Gen Zs in South Africa are their family members, their friends, and for some of them, a few politicians. So they're looking at leaders of substance, not leaders of style. So that's very interesting that is to see incredible. that shift happening. So <laughs> would TikTokers or in people in that generation call one another out if they see content that is just... Um, um, offensive um, to either race or gender or sex, would they call one another out on it? Absolutely. Young TikTokers are hugely almost militants in enforcing the zeitgeist as they believe in it. So, of course, sort of social justice terms and boundaries are always being shifted. The line's always moving as to what's acceptable. And we've seen this throughout human history. Things that were completely acceptable, even 20 years ago or now not acceptable. Even take something like gay marriage. It's still not legal in many parts of the world, but that zeitgeist is always, always shifting. And what TikTok is doing is they're kind of at the front of that zeitgeist. So they are leading the conversation about what is acceptable in terms of discourse and narrative and opinion and what is not. And one of the more interesting trends we've seen there is that K-pop TikTok, so K-pop is like Korean pop, it's almost like bubblegum pop, very cute, very sort of quiet as they call it, yet this corner of TikTok, that particular wormhole or rabbit hole, has become hugely engaged in policing speech and ideas on TikTok to make sure that people are staying within the boundaries and the norms of what is socially acceptable to say and the sort of opinions that are acceptable by the community and those that are not. And that has, of course, both positive and negative connotations to it. Positive because people are being called out for things like racism or homophobia, but also it has slightly sinister connotations in that that power and that clout to dictate the social narrative and what is acceptable and what is not can also start to sort of push some more questionable ideas being saying this is the only acceptable opinion to have and that what was up until yesterday a completely everyday opinion to have is now deemed unacceptable and people that find themselves on the wrong side of that ever shifting line can find themselves in huge trouble they can find themselves called out mobbed on these platforms and it's not you know specific to TikTok this cuts across multiple social media platforms but it can start to have impacts on their very real financial lives especially if they're earning money from being a TikTok influencer or if they are a public figure that what is said or how they are deemed or how they are tried without jury and cancelled on that platform can spill over into their very real lives and can also start to affect those around them, their family members, their friends and their children if they have any. So that's the more sort of serious side of the policing of acceptable thought going on by the crowd for the crowd right now. Should we be worried about that subversive nature of TikTok? Should that be a concern to us? Um, could it just cross the line and go into uh, and if just spill over outside of the platform into real world uh, ramifications and uh, repercussions? I think absolutely we should be worried about it, but I have to have a huge disclaimer on that and say it is not endemic just to TikTok. This whole acceleration of divisions in society and grouping people into me and you, us and them, getting ever widening you know, divisions between different camps and different ideologies in society is a hugely dangerous trend. Yes, in many ways it's been accelerated by social media because as more of us are connecting with more of us and those networks are becoming more complicated and the algorithms as they lead us down different garden paths to radicalize us all in slightly different ways, one click at a time, one like at a time, down into a particular ideological tribe. That is dangerous and that is accelerated by these platforms, but human history tells us very, very clearly that humans are susceptible to mass movements mm -hmm. and to othering people mm -hmm. in various different ways. And I think that from a sort of futurist trend analyst perspective, we need to be wary that we're not creating new enemies as much as we are eradicating the sort of old evils like the divisions between races or genders or different sexual orientations that's good we want to break down those boundaries but we must be careful then not to recreate new divisions between mm. people that think one way and people that think another way and that for me would be a sort of a, a longer term worry that we can see when we start using social media to exaggerate rather than close the differences between us.